Okay, thanks everyone for coming along. Um, I just want to welcome you all to the first Eric Berendt Law Lecture. I should introduce myself, I'm Jake Robottom and I'm one of the co-editors of the Journal of Media Law that's co-hosting this lecture. And it's called the Eric Berendt Lecture because we want to celebrate the career of Eric Berendt, who you will all know as a very distinguished scholar of media law and free speech. Um, he's started his career here in Oxford at St. Catherine's College and after that became the Goodman Professor of Media Law at UCL in London. And I think his body of work was really responsible for establishing media law and free speech as a kind of discipline, as an area of legal scholarship. And I certainly think his work, his book on freedom of speech, stands as quite an amazing contribution that I always use as a kind of starting reference point uh, when I'm working on this area, and I know many other scholars uh, use it in that way as well. Um, also in his career, Eric co-founded the Journal of Media Law, as I say, which is co-hosting the lecture this evening. A final version of the lecture we're hoping to publish in the journal, but that depends on how quickly Monroe delivers it, um, but that's been promised. Um, if you haven't checked out the Journal of Media Law, it's an international journal that covers lots of diverse issues relating to media law and media freedom. So do check it out on the Taylor and Francis website uh, for some of the latest articles. And if there are any academics in the audience, which there are, do consider us when you're thinking about where to send some of your articles. We're very lucky to have Munro Price as uh, the first, uh, giving the first lecture here. Uh, Munro, as you know, is at the Annenberg School at the University of Pennsylvania, and he really needs no introduction, given that we are at the Price Moot Court. <laughs> his topic for his lecture is newsworthy. It's been in the news this week, and luckily it's not about Brexit. So there's something that's newsworthy, it's not about that, and the title is The Mystery of Regulating Social Media. Munro. trying to learn new technology here. Uh, okay, great. This is the great technical uh, advisor to the Bonavera Institute. He's going to show me how to use a mouse. <laughs> so this is, um, I'm starting with this stat image of the statue of Eleanor Roosevelt, who was first lady in the administration of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. She was appointed delegate to the UN in 1945 and became the first chair of the UN Commission on Human Rights. As part of her function at the UN, she oversaw the drafting and adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which hugely advanced the idea of international norms of freedom of expression. She gave her all to this task, and we would not be so comfortably argue those rights without her efforts. The Declaration was a precursor to the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights, and as well to the powerful European Convention on Human Rights. This elegant statute is by Penelope Jenks. It sits since the 1990s near a traffic island in Riverside Park on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, 15 short blocks from where I live. It's a place for dog walkers and just plain walkers. I enjoy passing by on my way to Zabar's, wondering whether anyone takes notice or remembers her. I pause to read quotes by her and about her embedded in the statue's base space. It's a, it's a, it's a you can, I, I love the pensive quality of the statue. Eleanor Roosevelt thinking about the future, thinking about the role of rights in society. But it, there's a more specific reason to single out this work on this occasion. When Penelope Jenks had this sculpture realized, the foundry cast it in an edition of two. The copy languished in storage for many years. But just last October, the sibling version was installed right here on the beautiful grounds of Mansfield College in front of the brilliant new Bonavera Institute of Human Rights. So, okay, great. 
This is uh, Eleanor Roosevelt here at, on the grounds of Mansfield College. Um, so this sibling version was here. And Professor Cato Reagan was determined that Roosevelt should be recognized for her massive contributions to human rights and that this objective should be accomplished in proximity to the Institute. Hillary Clinton, who spoke at the dedication in New York City in 1996, spoke at the 2018 dedication here. All of you brushed by the sculpture on your way into the building, and you should take a further glance on your way out. I can imagine Eleanor Roosevelt's satisfaction at this assemblage of young scholars from around the globe. She would have rejoiced in the establishment of the Bonavero Institute and particularly loved the moot court bringing together so many students with such passionate commitment, contributing to fervent debate on freedom of expression. Her idea of human rights is institutionalized through the dis diligence, hard work, and dedication of the competitors and multiplied through the friendships that, that occur among you. Some very important aspect of what is universal is captured by this, the extraordinary diversity of backgrounds, but unity of purpose that is present in this room. This week here at the Moot Court caps a year of global debate. Each of the, and it's one of the things that I, which I particularly love about the debate, having a kind of global discussion of major issues in, in Cairo and in Belgrade and Kiev and in Delhi and in Beijing, among other places. Uh, each of the mooters here has been working out the consequences of technological and social change for the ways of pr promoting and presenting and understanding a new freedom of expression. And I think that's another thing which I, I think I'm sure is striking here, that each generation thinks about this question in new ways because of new technologies and, and new context. This is also the inauguration of an annual lecture honoring Professor Eric Berendt. I can only echo the many tributes over the years to him for his vast contributions to comparative media law. The Universal Declaration that was born from Eleanor Roosevelt's dedication and zeal was in large part a collection of hopes and aspirations. Eric Berendt's contributions and those of Tom Gibbons, Rachel Crawford Smith, and Jake Robot, who are all here, and Damien Tambini. Uh, Eric's contribution encompasses the highest function of the academic lawyer, clarifying, synthesizing, and evaluating the process of implementing law. Barron's meticulous and comprehensive volumes have fueled the efforts of many judges, lawyers, NGOs, academics, and others over decades. In his careful of hands, the mosaic of media and free expression is arranged, uh, criticized, elevated, and rendered coherent. He has captured the necessity of being comparative and the complicated qualities of media that so often transcends frontiers while remaining rooted in historic notions of the state. Eric brought his analytical capacities to these issues, among other places, in his chapter on the internet in his 2005 book, Freedom of Speech. He saw the sweeping implications of the very existence of the internet for modifying traditional speech rules, and he called for caution and an avoidance in his striking phrase of a bonfire of controls. At this very moment in time, today, yesterday, tomorrow, the spirit and values both of Rose, Eleanor Roosevelt and Eric Berendt are particularly relevant and urgent. The world in its different parts is struggling with what models to use in the process of shaping norms and institutionalizing them as media technologies and their applications dizzyingly alter. Existing laws and practices seem inadequate to address the new dynamics. Political systems fear destabilization. Extremism and its perils multiply, and citizens worry about diminution of their selfhood. Mark Zuckerberg himself 
just last week, quite notably repeated, a, opened a huge policy door. I believe we need a more active role for government and regulators, Z Zuckerberg surprisingly said. He called for intervention in four areas, harmful content, election integrity, privacy, I say privacy because we're doing it in England, <laughs> and data portability. Uttered by Zuckerberg, this was initiating a magic incantation to be scoured, repeated, re-invoked. This, this idea of, uh, I believe we need a more active role for government, words that hardly have ever fallen from the lips of an internet entrepreneur. And how that happens and why it happens is a really interesting question. And only yesterday, the government of the UK issued a white paper on regulation of social media, which would create a new kind of authority and a model for supervision in many contexts. Uh, and I, I think of this, t today we had a panel, a discussion with Facebook. It was really interesting to see the students with a new vocabulary, or at least I, it was a vocabulary that I didn't have, and they have about the, in, the intimate aspects of Facebook and its regulation. The white paper and the Facebook statement was a re reminder of an important uh, fact. I'm sorry about the light even. Each new technological breakthrough in communications engenders its own long, power-filled debate about structure. That was true of the telegraph, of telephone, radio, television, satellite, and now the internet. Who owns, who operates, who sets and implements standards, what is the political economy? These questions haunt and plague us daily. Each new technology forces a rethinking of basic fundamental aspects of what is meant by the right to receive and impart information. Each new advance creates a demand for new technical, bureaucratic, and legal arrangements. Every aspect of regulating social media is related to this topic. And this interplay between technology, law, and cultures has been an underlying theme of the annual moot court argument. As the highly charged debates mirror turbulent events occurring in the world. There's so much that comes out of these arguments at the regions and here at Oxford. In many areas of continued jurisprudential restlessness and requires ongoing concern in political decision making. I, I will talk about two major recurring areas a bit. The role of the state in a, uh, in a contrast of transnational flows of information and the machinery and delicacy of self-regulation. These are two concepts that have been really interesting, important and interesting. One is the role of the state and the, uh, also this, the, the idea of self-regulation as an alternative way of thinking of regulation. So let me turn to each in turn. I, I like looking at uh, Ellen, this is Eleanor Roosevelt while we think about these questions. I, I noticed the golden patina of Eleanor against the golden walls of the college. I think it's very nice. And one of the things I'd say, taking a little detour here, is Eleanor looks much happier here at Mansfield <laughs> than, than she does at Riverside Park. <laughs> in, in every it, issue, every iteration of the moot, boundaries and disputes about jurisdiction have played a significant role in the pattern has been true throughout the history of modern communications. Who decides whether there should be a right to be forgotten and where it should hold sway? How can a society maintain the integrity of election politics in the face of porous borders? Can different societies enact and enforce disparate definitions of hate speech or, or conceptions of terrorism and threats to stability? Emphases change. Is it desirable or possible to move to a system of universal values and is such a system absolutely essential for an administrative, uh, an administrable, administrable platform that links persons around the world? A major policy question for each new media has been the role of lines on a map when most media technologies are not natural respecters of borders. 
it, it was very interesting, even in the period of, uh, uh, of over-the-air television, to see how, how, how the borders get enforced between Mexico and the United States, or Canada and the United States, in, in Europe itself. Because these were media that knew no borders, but borders were essential. And the question was, how would they be drawn? How would they be enforced? Et cetera, et cetera. So the, the, um, uh, the history of states is very much about the capacity to manage significant aspects of culture, language, and of religion within their confines or the confines of regions or empire. Many, many people here in this room have been have dealt with the question of television without frontiers or what, what should the broadcasting culture be of, of a European Union. And one of the things that's been interesting to me in the Brexit debate has been how important the UK's contribution has been, Ofcom's contribution, to the thinking in Europe about what media law and policy should be. So Ofcom has been a kind of leading voice and I, I, the idea that it would be absent from the table or marginalized is a very scary idea. Uh, so uh, anyway, the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights, extending the Universal Declaration, introduced the radical concept that the right to receive and impart information should exist through any media and regardless of frontiers. This was a, is, is, is and continues to be a really radical idea that, that regardless of frontiers, should, should erase some concept of the role of the state in regulating media. And I think it's, it's never been fully worked out what regardless of frontiers really means. Unless, Eric, you have some secret answer to the question of and I'm sure you do. But, uh, so until the arrival of satellites, the language was bold, but not necessarily revolutionary. And I, I think that's another interesting question, because when the words, regardless of frontiers, were drafted, there was limited capacity for regard, the t broadcasting regardless of trans frontiers to change or destabilize anything. And then we have technological revolutions in which regardless of frontiers means an enormous amount in terms of the impact that it can have. The new technologies of the second half of the 20th century including cable and satellite, began to seriously undermine these national systems. And it was with the dramatic rise of the internet that the promise of the ICCPR could be more fully realized. This was the technology and potential infrastructure that could uh, seamlessly and effortlessly function regardless of frontiers and proceeded to do so. For the technology's founders, the overcoming of boundaries was a major feature, it wasn't a, a mistake. The internet seemed to have an architecture that rendered borders almost obsolete. Religions, corporations, political parties, all became experts in functioning transnationally. The implicit hopes of the Universal Declaration seemed to be in harmony with a kind of technological determinism. So you had this period where, the, the, where this issue of regardless of frontiers could really mean something. But the 1980s and the period after have also seen efforts to control the ways in which state sovereignty could be maintained consistent with the growth of the new technologies. The regulatory drama has involved what might be called the resilience of the state in the face of these new media technologies. How to protect cultural and economic interests, how to deal with language, and their survival, how and whether to protect religious identities, and of course, how to protect existing centers of power. Singapore, China, and others developed an infrastructure of information flows that maintained the authority of the state. The last decade and more has been about this struggle, the large-scale effort to domesticate the internet rather than see it as an instrument for transcending traditional cultural and political lines. Our mood has been livelier because it lives in this global struggle over the definition of new technologies. The mood lives with the central questions of free flows and state sovereignty, dreams of universality, and fears of balkanization. So I think this is 
an important element is the idea that uh, the technology of freedom had this implicit threat, which has been realized in many ways, and yet this, the effort by states singly or in combination to contain the impact of this on their political power. It's the spirit of the move to encourage vigorous debate over the meaning of the ICCPR, but as well to encourage what might be called a speech empowering interpretation. It would be tragic in these populist and nationalist times if the tendency were to yield a stifling as opposed to enabling an enriching form of information sovereignty. In these times of preoccupation over migration and borders, we can also see the data and content equivalent of control of movement of people across borders. Could there be a day, or has it already come, when information like people will require visas to cross borders? So it, this is something which I, I think about, and that is the, the equivalent of the kind of, par uh, not necessarily paranoia, but fear of large-scale movements of people, will that be reflected in thinking about large-scale uh, movement of information? And uh, you think one could think of um, just as a, a state has the monopoly over the control of legitimate violence, does it have control over the legitimate flow of information in some way? Is there, is there some hidden aspect of this that uh, has, we haven't really surfaced, in, at least in, in parts of the West. In all these ways, the regulatory drama has involved this question of state resilience, how the state or its equivalent uses regulatory power to protect itself. There, these are extended parts of the regulation infrastructure. I've written about a plethora of markets for loyalties, one of my favorite phrases, arguing that historically, large-scale sellers of allegiances, religious empires, religious empires, advocates of consumerism, et cetera, use the state to control entry into the market and limit access to audiences by challengers to the status quo, as, for example, by foreign powers. You could just see the, the preoccupation with election integrity as a case study in this, in this question of uh, maintaining a cartel of who can, com who can compete in the market for allegiances within a state, uh, as opposed to uh, allowing others to involve themselves. Much of what we call consumer communications regulation is the result of agreements in these markets to shape and limit entry to allow or disallow new competitors. Just this last week, the Wall Street Journal reported that Russia was seeking, quote, unprecedented control over the internet so it could more effectively filter information coming into the country and simultaneously allow the government, quote, to cut itself off from online traffic in a crisis. Thomas Grove uh, was the author of this article. This is a state, he wrote, learning from China and framing the nature of its markets for loyalties. So, at any rate, this is a big aspect of the way I see the role of the state. So I want to turn briefly to the question of norms and moderation. So a complementary debate, also reflected in the history of this move, is the debate over the shape and force of self-regulation. And self-regulation has sort of had its day. One of the things that's really interesting about the white paper, which just came out, is at least the assertion of a return to regulation. And this is also reflected in the Zuckerberg statement calling for sharing of regulation, or sharing of power. Is this, is this valid? Is, this, is there self-regulation uh, can be discussed in many ways as to whether it's real, whether it's just a, a, an effort to, to um, avoid regulation. Is, is self-regulation what exists in the shadow of regulation, et cetera? So um, how it shades into cooperation, co-regulation, or even the illusion of regulation through the technique of relatively empty promises. There's a perceived need for massive assertion of standards, but simultaneously pervasive apprehension about unalloyed intervention by the state. 
this is the kind of anxiety that pervades us about wanting regulation and wanting the absence of the state as well. And, and the question is, how does this anxiety play itself out? And what, how is self-regulation a kind of psychological substitute or uh, a psychological way of dealing with this anxiety? Uh, and one of the beauties of self-regulation is that there are sort of oddities, I would say an oddity, is that things that a state cannot do or should not do consistent with free expression norms are done, indeed are urged to be done, just as there is criticism for overly zealous moderation, there is satisfaction that moderators take down material that could not be removed under free expression standards. This is, I think, one of the great puzzles of our time, a kind of living in the umbrella of free expression, but living in a society where the, the, the platforms have a broad and often unreviewable, unaccountable power to take down material. And so how, how to play this out and how self-regulation is the formula that we use that allows this conflict to take place. So under the, under the kind of terms of self-regulation, uh, things that would be unacceptable, even in debate, are standard and desired. Uh, as a result of this indeterminacy, there are ubiquitous examples of escalation in the demand for self-regulation with varying formulas for the shape that that self-regulation -regula should take. To be sh sure, the most persistent issue has been the regulation and self-regulation of content, hate speech, terrorist speech, and dangerous speech that breaches public order. And it, it's, it's interesting to see the competition among academics and others to figure out how to capture this phrase. What, what are the complications of the word hate speech, terrorist speech, and dangerous speech uh, that breed special order? Self-regulation, as I said, exists in the shadow of the state. And what constitutes self-regulation involves bargain for agreement to avoid harsh legislative enactments. This is, will be interesting in the implementation of the white paper where these codes are supposed to be developed by a yet-to-be-constituted regulatory authority. Who's going to be around the table? How, how are these codes of conduct going to be developed? Um, it, is, it has been a month since the de devastating slaughter in New Zealand, the killing of innocents during moments of worship. Kevin Roast of the New York Times wrote eloquently about how the events of Christchurch were tied to the rhythms practices and memes of the internet. He wrote that the internet is now the place where the seeds of extremism are planned and, uh, and watered, planted and watered, where platform incentives guide creators toward the, cre creators toward the ideological poles and where people with hateful and violent beliefs can find <laughs> and feed off one another. <coughs> As with each such episode, New Zealand events <coughs> gave rise to a new and more intense round of introspection among society at large and within the platform companies themselves. The scope of self-regulation becomes a question. In New Zealand, the perpetrators simultaneously film and broadcast his actions on Facebook Live, bringing into question how each such streaming could be controlled, if at all, and how norms should shift or change in light of the events. It's very interesting. I, I, uh, many of you know Patty Scannell, who wrote a, a little book uh, about live television. What, what, is, what does the idea of live mean in this society? And live is a kind of alien creature, different from all the other controlled and compacted opportunities. And the question is, do, is there room in this society for live, or does, is there need? And this, this is brought forth by Facebook Live and the uh, New Zealand events. Should there, this was a, in a much more laughable context, this was 
brought up, up in the uh, halftime national football uh, um, finals of uh, wardrobe, what was the phrase, wardrobe? Uh, malfunction, exactly. Uh, and the networks have gone since to a 30 second delay so that they can catch wardrobe dysfunction in the future. Uh, but so this whole question of whether, whether you can have something called Facebook Live and how it should be regulated is really important. And prior to Christchurch, Facebook had banned white supremacist content from its platform, but tolerated white nationalism and advocacy of white separation. In the light of the mosque massacres, Facebook views had been changed by civil society groups and experts in race relations. And it now believes that white nationalism and separatism cannot be meaningfully separated from white supremacy and organized hate groups. Community standards were adjusted accordingly. And it's going to be interesting to see how this the idea of these standards being set by the platforms changes if the white if this white paper goes through ICE. the white paper is not connected to white supremacy, but um, in, uh, I don't think. <laughs> I'm sure there's a link of some kind. Uh, it is in light of such encounters, encounters the intrusion of reality, the concepts of self-regulation are good. Um, increased attention to norms and standards has, over time, yielded increased attention to issues of enforcement. And this focus has led to a spike of interest in moderation. The, the, I, uh, it's been interesting to hear uh, the, the intensity of this the word, the use of the word moderation as a, a new way of, of kind of legitimating uh, uh, forms of censorship, appointment of individuals who have the capacity to make decisions to cancel uh, material. As an integral, integral part of self-regulation, platforms are increasingly relying on private arrangements human and machine to meet expectations as the platform policing and to navigate zones of public inquiry and threats of intervention. When Facebook was confronted with the charge that its pages were filled with material that enhanced hatred of and genocidal tendencies against the Rohingya in Myanmar, its response in part was to promise to upgrade its surveillance of what was allowed on its platform. It promised to hire many additional individuals to augment moderation, training them to scrutinize postings and remove those that, after some no, uh, nominal uh, quality control, was decided violated certain Facebook norms contained in community standards and other documents. Self-regulation was the umbrella affixed to these extraordinarily significant aspects of structure of information flow. We don't know whether these strips were useful, whether these uh, steps were useful, one could ask. How could platforms scale up performance? Could they find, train, and deploy enough people? Would algorithms come riding to the rescue? And uh, how could responsibilities be divided? And I, I thought there's, a, there's what might be called an algorithm imperative. Again, something which is uh, relatively novel a kind of necessity to have greater and greater machine involvement. And one of the things that's been slightly interesting to watch is the debate about the relationship between the human and the algorithmic. And uh, whether the human is a kind of aesthetic add-on, as it were, uh, something that we, we want for some sort of self-respect uh, purposes, that there should be a human involvement in the in the question of, of, of moderation. Uh, as we'll see, there's increasing worry about the platforms taking up so many roles. In the last year or more, the pressures and claims for improved performance seem to be more ambitious in scale and prob probably in, in impact. And one of the things here that's been interesting is that this discussion and conversation between the EU and the platforms, how quickly can you take down material? Can you, can, you, can you take it all down? Can you do it in two hours? Can you do it in 20 minutes? So the, 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 this has led to more and more, in my view, unrealistic 
promises by the platforms. Maybe, maybe they're, they are realistic, but I don't, I don't think so. Um, Charlton Gillespie, in his elegant 2018 book, Custodians of the Internet, points out that moderation is difficult to get right because it is resource intensive and relentless, requiring often untenable decisions based on unclear standards. One mistake, as he and others point out, can create a disastrous and dramatic, dramatic public hue and cry. One failure can create public outrage that overwhelms a million quiet successes. The great platforms now with huge economic interests at stake agree to achieve almost impossible goals through their efforts at moderation. Seemingly only with algorithmic assistance on a massive scale, scale can these promises be redeemed. And algorithms, unlike human moderation, are tempting age, are a tempting agent. Unlike humans, they do not suffer post-traumatic stress syndrome from hours of exposure to the worst of imagery, nor do they require training beyond the mechanical. Perhaps there is, as I said, an algorithmic imperative. Well, norms and moderation in their enforcement relate to the overall purpose of a platform. And here, for one last time, I'm going to refer to Mark Zuckerberg. In a strategic blog some weeks ago, Zuckerberg signaled a potential switch in Facebook's marketing strategy. Zuckerberg described two Facebooks, a town hall Facebook and a living room Facebook. Zuckerberg asserted that for the last 15 years, Facebook has connected persons and families, creating a, what he thought was a town hall environment, at least he characterized it as such and, uh, for his own gentle purposes. But he said people want increasingly to connect privately in the digital equivalent of a living room. This is really about encryption. He did not fully argue that the town hall function should be subordinated, but he did seem to say that the living room function should be strengthened, should indeed become the foundation of a new, more secure, more intimate Facebook. This would be a Facebook capable of achieving a new kind of privacy for privacy. A living room Facebook would pr present a different challenge for regulation, for thinking about norms, moderation, and even borders. This is about a kind of skirting of the complex, skirting of the uh, terroristic public, and sort of a protection for Facebook and platforms in the future. And I, I think this, if I, uh, if I can conclude with this, is to say that um, the, these issues, norm development, borders and sovereignty, problems of policing, would not have been unknown to Eleanor Roosevelt, and they have been the food for thought for Eric Berendt. But they arise now in a form that could fall outside our common conceptualizations. Where there's a kind of, this, side, this, this goes to the living room and town hall question, there's a kind of new language of regulation, a new language of interactions, which is, is for a new generation, and that, that's why it's really nice to have it here at the Moot. And I, I, I would say that uh, I feel, and I'm, I'm sure that others of my generation feel this as well, that, that we, we've, we've tried to learn new technologies, new languages of cable, satellite, etc. At some point, it ends, <laughs> and we're, we, it's beyond our capacity to learn these new, 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 uh, new. Uh, languages, as it were. Uh, and this gets us back to the moot, the competitors who are here and the struggle for a future in which social media plays an abundant and constructive role. The issues that have animated the moot over the last 12 years are and will remain thrilling opportunities. We hope that your participation in the moot propels you to further creative engagement. The MOOC can be a mere rehearsal for engagement in your universities and in your country. A few words of conclusion. I know I speak for the Secretariat of the MOOC in saying what a privilege it has been to work with thousands of young law students, judges, 
coaches and sponsors. I want to acknowledge the support of the Faculty of Law and the constellation of scholars and projects addressing these questions from different distinguished perches. The Oxford, here, the Oxford Internet Institute, the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism, now the Bonavero Institute, and the program on comparative media law and policy, which gave birth to the MOOC. And there's the institution known here as Timothy Garden Ash, which has so directly and forcefully championed the right to freedom of expression. And of course, Jake Robottom now in the Media Law Journal. Uh, earlier in the talk, I referred to the satisfaction Eleanor Roosevelt would have taken in this assembly in this gathering of mooters from our own United Nations. During this formative period, while the moot was under the creative direction of Professor Nicole Stremlaw, the competition has touched the lives of thousands of law students and ju judges around the world. Nicole has sought to expand the moot's creative force by solidifying its presence in places where debate on the rule of role of speech would be most cherished and needed. The moot reveled in its footing in Afghanistan and Bangladesh, its manifestations in Egypt and the Philippines, its legacy in the Balkans. Uh, it, so I, I want to thank her. Uh, so uh, the moot has altered the teaching and study of media law and information law and policy in many venues. In a few places, the moot has been the catalyst for centers for the continuing and advanced study of these issues, as is the case with, for example, the Center for Law for Governance and Communications in Delhi. In many places, it has led to the additions of media law to a curriculum. Even today, I met with a, a group from Iran who wanted us to encourage and sustain a greater uh, opportunity for students in Tehran and Iran generally to study media law. And we will try to deal with that. It is hard to capture this category of impact. I'll close with this excerpt from a note we received from a young woman from Tehran. Today I am writing you this as I am the most motivated I've been in my whole life to make the impossible possible, to be the best that I can and to pay back to the world and be a little, and be a little of a change to it. I can tell you how instructive these days were, these matches I attended and took notes of and those priceless conversations I made with winners, participants, judges, and professors. I now know that I can succeed next time as there are people to listen and to give support. Today, after so many months, for the first time in this earth, in this path, I feel like I can, I am not alone. This is like a religious testimony, but it has to do with the group court, so I'm you know. But anyway, th I want to thank uh, Eric. It's really been an honor to meet you 20 or 30 years ago, I think, have you helped to guide me in my way. And thanks to all of you for this opportunity. Thank you very much. <laughs>